Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nettling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to bring topics and guests that will empower you to become the confident leader to take your business and your life to the next level. Today, I am very excited to have Dr. Judy Morley as my guest. And let me tell you about Dr. Judy. She is a, a coach, a speaker, author, and executive and entrepreneur with over 20 years of leadership experience. She works with female executives who are ready to lead their team through a pivot, change, or conflict. Having overcome stage four cancer with a 25% chance of survival, and that was 24 years ago, congratulations. Two divorces and a failed business, Dr. Morley knows a thing or two about navigating transition and is still thriving. Experience has had her at the helm of organizations that went through mergers, catastrophic changes in leadership, headquarter recollection, easy for me to say, headquarters relocations, and of course, a global pandemic. Every time she makes sure the organization and all the people in it are better because of the change. So I chose for our topic to be mastering conflict without being a bitch. And we all want to welcome Dr. Judy Morley to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. You know, um, for those of us that are in their 60s, we went through leadership where it was male dominated, you know, and it was mostly that male energy that was going on. And so most of my early managers, especially when I worked for my last company, that was a transportation company that I loved, my managers, my mentors were women who were trying to be like their mentors, male. And Mm -hmm. so they often were that B word. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I did not want to be that, and so that journey that took me to where I am today was one that um, it was interesting to see how people managed and navigated through conflict without being a horrible person. <laughs> <laughs> so we always start out with an easy question. Please share with uh, our audience where you live. Oh, well, I live in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Awesome. The site of, the site of one of the largest conflicts on the North American continent. <laughs> yes. I, you know, that was interesting when I went through your bio. I read that you do some of your retreats in the Gettysburg area. And I thought that was really, a, that would be a cool retreat to go on because mm-hmm. you, there's a lot of life lessons I think you can um, learn from studying that Gettysburg battle. Absolutely. I mean, if you want to talk about leading in rapidly changing stressful environments, you know, there, <laughs> there's quite quite a bit to learn. Yeah. Absolutely. So how did you come up with the idea for your book? And, and please go ahead and show your book uh, so people can see that. So mastering conflict without being a bitch, get results without losing your cool. Mm-hmm. So how did you come up with this wonderful, wonderful title? Well, <laughs> I was I was working with my coach, my leadership coach, and <clears throat> I was working on a coaching package and she kept saying, well, what do you really want to help your clients with? What do you really want to help your clients with? And I hemmed and hawed, well, I want them to know that they can, you know, do this and do that, I hemmed and hawed. And she kept 
saying, get clearer, get clearer. And in frustration, I was like, I want these women to know that they can go into conflict without being a bitch. Okay. (laughs) My coach said, (laughs) well, there you go. I was like, oh, okay. And I realized that, you know, my career has similar to what you shared, Vicki. I love that. Um, You know, when I started in leadership, women had two choices. They either went along to get along and that wasn't in the best interest of their career, uh, their own advancement, sometimes their work-life balance, because they were just doormats too afraid to speak up in this male-dominated world. Or they took on the kind of overly aggressive characteristics of their male, I'll call them role models, male leaders. Um, But in a female form that doesn't come across well. And so women have had this kind of false dichotomy throughout the latter half of the 20th and early part of the 21st century in leadership of being a doormat or a bitch. And there really is a a way, there really is a way to be kind, to be firm, to be clear with your boundaries, to get results and to continue to, you know, be, present, kind, and clear with the people that you're working with. Yeah. And it's so interesting. In my first years, I worked with, um, I, I supervised nine people and they were all female. No, not, no, I had a couple guys and I got them to do fantastic things. The interesting thing was when it came time to promote me to manager, the thing that kept on coming up was, well, no, you're not strong enough. You're, you're, you're too soft and, and people walk all over you. And I'm thinking, these are the same people that are doing whatever I asked them to do. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so it, it really was, I think just, they didn't understand how I could get people to do what I wanted them to do without yelling and screaming and being horrible to them. And yeah. uh, it wasn't until I finally, um, uh, got to be 50 years old and had years of successful being able to do it that I no longer cared about becoming anybody higher than what I was, that all things started to fall in front of me and opportunities came. And I had one mentor, one mentor who really saw something in me that was, he was willing to take a risk that maybe I could do this. And that changed everything. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely we're I think we've entered a new paradigm, you know, the emerging workforce, you know, aka millennials, um have definitely changed how we think about leadership and what they will tolerate and what they won't, both male and female. And that with now having had, you know, at least 50 years of women in leadership roles in the Fortune 500, Mm -hmm. Uh, and nonprofits and uh, media, we are shifting the paradigm. But there's still this lingering sense, you know, that, you know, you have to either, you know, be quiet or be overly sweet (laughs) or, you know, go the other direction. And Mm -hmm. it's funny that you referenced um, when you got to be 50 and didn't care, because that's one of the lines I have in my book is that, you know, my goal for women who read this book or anyone who reads this book is that they can master conflict without being a bitch. But most importantly, if someone calls them a bitch, I don't want them to care. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and it's, it's really interesting because we have this, we talk about the millennials and how they change things, but I remember when I was 20 and mm-hmm working, you know, I, I started working at 21 and I wasn't in college. And so there was always that self doubt that kept me from doing what my gut said was right and following the leader kind of thing. And, and, you know, so I was a tremendous follower, even though people would say things and I would think, well, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Why don't I just say it? Why don't I mm-hmm. voice it? And and so that's partly why I teach public speaking as well as leadership, because I think they go hand in hand. Absolutely. But, you know, I, I think there there's a, a still that issue of trying 
to navigate the the female and the male and thinking you have to be one or the other. And, and so part of what I teach it and what I think you're talking about is you have to just have, you know, not even a balance, but know when, just as you know, when to use the right communication style or when to use the right leadership style, you need to know when you should be more feminine or when to be more masculine and, and what will be the best results when you do it at the right time. Absolutely. And, you know, when it, the, the thing that, you know, I really want um, people to take away from my book is that the communication is never about the other person. The conflict mm. is never about the other person. Now, there's some qualifiers to that, of course, because there are people who can do some really rotten things. Um, mm. But we always, always, always can be in control of the conflict. And I am not in any way suggesting that we don't address bad behavior, that we just suck it up. I'm not suggesting that at all. But how we choose to manage that, how we choose to deal with that makes all the difference in how we navigate conflict. Mm. So, you know, I was, I came of age, um, it seemed like I always had was the lone female in a lot of male dominated worlds. You know, my first mm -hmm. um, job was at an advertising agency, but not just any advertising agency. We did advertising for used car salesmen. Oh, great. So um, <laughs> I had a lot of used car dealers as my clients. Um, and then, you know, I went on to get a PhD and I became a professor at a very young age. I was a 37 year old woman in a room full of 60 and 70 year old men. So I found that, you know, I always had a choice of, at, to your point, did I speak up or did I not? Did I have the confidence to say what needed to be said or not? And it took a while of not having the confidence and not speaking up and finding that that was hurting my career before I got the confidence and courage to actually have what I call courageous conversations. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there there's a lot of that, but there's also a lot of just... Um, you know, pre pre work in conflict of anticipating, mm -hmm. and then there's a lot of just <laughs> I call it playing dumb. There's a lot of playing dumb where you just say, "No, that's not going to happen." Thank you anyway, though. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for bringing it up. But no, that's not going to happen. And you just stick to your guns in a very nice way and mm -hmm. don't get sucked into an argument. Yeah. It's sometimes it's like arguing with your three-year-old. It's yeah. just a waste of breath. <laughs> yes. I actually use um, strategies that I learned in a class 25 years ago called Parenting with Love and Logic. <laughs> so I, there you I, go. I use it more in my with my staff than I ever used it with my kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I found that um, to be very true <laughs> and I'll just leave it there. So what methods do you re recommend for mastering conflict um, in the workplace as we just were discussing? Yeah, well, I, I start with, you know, first of all, anticipating potential problems. I think mm -hmm. we all kind of know that there are both personality and procedural places where we run into problems. You know, the, the procedural ones are easier to see. They're the bottlenecks, they're the the ones where, you know, everybody's depending on one department or things like that. So recognize that those are there. And if you can do something to change the system, great. But if not, if that's just the system, know that they're there and anticipate that there are mm -hmm. going to be some slowdowns there. Um, and then the personality ones, I think it's okay to have high expectations for people who have oil and water personalities to work well together and you need to anticipate if you're putting two people on a project that don't generally get along, but because of their areas of expertise really mm -hmm. need to work on this project, you can anticipate the problems and address them up front. You yeah. know, they don't have to be BFFs, but they mm -hmm. do need to work well together, right? Yeah. And, and so a lot of it is anticipating. So that's, um, and that's taking a step back and being a little more strategic. Um, mm -hmm. Also setting very clear agreements, establishing agreements about how everyone will work together, making sure that these agreements are clear, not just mentioned offhand, but actually formalized. 
it's, I don't always recommend they be put in writing, but sometimes I do. It depends. Mm -hmm. um, I currently am a, I, an owner of a business right now, and uh, we have a variety of stakeholders in this business. And our stakeholders meetings have gotten very frustrating because no matter how many times I say something in a meeting, there's always some person that comes up and goes, well, how I, this is a surprise. I didn't know about it. And I'm thinking, my goodness, I've said it seven times. So yeah. for those, I've started doing it in writing. But just establish those clear agreements. Um, then also um, hold people accountable. And this is where most people break down. Nobody likes to hold people accountable. And we feel like in order to hold them accountable, we have to get angry with them or make them wrong or blame. Mm -hmm. And we don't. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's where sometimes playing dumb is great. You know, you just state the facts like, um, well, Vicki, you said that you were going to have this done on Friday and it's Friday and it's not done. And um, I need you to fix the situation. Yeah. You know, you don't have to, why didn't you get it done? Or you never get it done. Or I knew I shouldn't have depended on her or anything like that. You just state the facts and go to solution. But you do have to hold people accountable and know that there are consequences with this renegotiated agreement. You know, if I give you mm -hmm. until Monday, I expect it Monday by five, correct? Right. Correct, right. you know. Um, and then overcoming resistance, because mm -hmm. the minute you have to hold someone accountable, they're gonna resist, they're gonna make an excuse, or they're gonna object somehow, or they're gonna blame. Um, and this is where I, I do just play dumb. You know, if you say, well, I tried to get it by Friday, but I just couldn't. Mm -hmm. I understand that's totally legit, but the agreement was Friday. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I, I can't do it by myself. I need, okay, but the agreement was Friday. So what are we going to do? And you just repeat the same thing over and over again and let them figure it out. It's amazing. That was a love and logic thing, parenting thing that I learned. It's amazing. If you just continue to say one sentence of what went wrong and what you expect and then shut up, they will figure it out on their own right in front of your eyes. So that's the easiest way to overcome resistance is just smile. I, oh boy. Oh, your car broke down. Oh my gosh. That's terrible. I understand. And the agreement was that it, with this. And so how are we going to fix it? <laughs> you know. Um, and then the last thing I talk about in the book is how to end unproductive relationships productively. Because the time will come when you're going to have to let someone go if you're in leadership. It, nobody, nobody escapes that trap in their career. Um, and so how do you do it while keeping the other person's dignity and yours intact? Oh, I lost you, Vicki. I can't hear you. All right. So the next thing that I really love for you to share are any tips that you have to provide people with help to how to really, when you have those, those fires that happen really quickly, you know, those, and, uh -huh. you know, people sometimes, as you said, jump in and want to just react how can you advise them to maybe take a walk step back or you know <laughs> what kind of tips yep. can you give people to really help to diffuse something rather than being reactive yeah well you you've named several of them take deep breath i mean everything that you've learned growing up is right you mm -hmm. know take deep breaths go for a walk the reason the reason we react and you know, from brain science, psychology, emotional intelligence perspective, whatever, we, we know this, it's well documented. We react emotionally and our emotional brain is the deepest part of our brain and it's the one that reacts immediately. Yeah. But our cerebral cortex is the one that overlayers the emotional brain and it's the one that takes a little time to think. Mm -hmm. It's the one that after you've had an argument with your significant other and acted very childishly, your cerebral cortex is the one 15 minutes later that goes, oh, I should have said this <laughs> because it takes a while to catch up. Yeah. So the trick is to remember that you want to react from your cerebral cortex, not from your limbic brain, not from your emotional state. And so if uh, the, the biggest clue I ask people to look for is their body. Mm -hmm. If you're palms are sweating, if your mouth is dry, if your jaw is clenched, if your heart is racing, if your breathing has increased, do not react. 
just yeah. stop. And, and, you know, you may not know what you're feeling. You may not understand why it's happening. You don't need to, but your body will never lie to you. It will tell you that you are having an emotional reaction and that is not the right place to react from. And you then are bringing the conflict to the situation, regardless of what the other person just did or said to you. Yeah. So you need to check in with your body. And if you have any of those symptoms, if you will, um, of, of being em emotionally elevated, go take a break until that, that dies down. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I need to hit pause. I need to think about this. Can I get back to you on this? Unless of course the building is literally on fire. <laughs> and then if the building is literally on fire, you need that adrenaline rush. So use it. But mm -hmm. 99.999% of the things that trigger us throughout the day, you know, we're not, the building's not on fire. We're not being chased by a saber toothed tiger. Uh, we're, you know, we're just triggered from old emotional patterns. Mm -hmm. So just stop. You don't have to go to therapy. You don't have to figure out what it is. Just wait for the emotions to die down and then craft a response. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, if we go back to whenever, we were first in management. We just came into work. We did our job. We went home and, and our managers didn't try to figure out anything about us. We were just somebody that did the job. And if we didn't do the job, there's somebody else to do the job as mm -hmm. opposed to having the right person in the right job at the right time. Mm -hmm. So in, in situations, a lot of times I think your uh, conflict will happen and and you may know, if you know your people well enough, you may know they're, the buttons that they can push that are going to take you off. And sometimes I think it, as a, a manager or a supervisor or a team lead, um, it's it's really not the action, the activity. It's how is somebody going to perceive how you reacted to that, mm -hmm. that you didn't stand your ground or you didn't... Um, you let them take ownership of something that is really your job. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, well, how, how can we have that flexibility to know when it's okay to not be the boss? Yeah. <laughs> the other person has it handled and maybe it isn't how you would handle it, but it, maybe it was still okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that, that is a, a communication strategy and it goes back to those agreements you know, um, one of one of my entrepreneurial endeavors right now is I own a little bakery here in Gettysburg. It's called the Gettysburg Cookie Company. And uh, I'm the owner and I am right now the operator, although I have a store manager. But I've am, I have set very clear agreements with every one of my staff members about what they're empowered to do and what they're not. Now, that's a retail context, but they all know. We have the procedure of how to package the cookies, but if someone wants the cookies packaged a different way, do it, you know? So we, we've set those agreements up front. So mm -hmm. again, anticipating if you, you know, if you're, someone wants to take ownership of something that really should be your job, setting those agreements. Great. If you have a better idea, great, but here's how we're going to communicate about it. Here's, you know, the benchmarks that are expected. Here's how uh, we're going to wrap up with things. So setting those really does help you as a leader let go while knowing that everything's still under your purview. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, a lot of the entrepreneurs are looking for that financial freedom to go and, you know, not be tied to their business, but to have the business run smoothly without them, which, which means <laughs> yeah. you have to have those guidelines. You have to have those processes and procedures that people can follow and not be calling you every five minutes. How do I do this? Can I do this or whatnot? And exactly. uh, so that's where delegation becomes sometimes um, a double-edged sword for some, some people. Some individuals, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So what would you give as advice to someone whenever they're in that difficult situ situation and um, they've looked at the policies, they've looked at the procedures, they, they've thought about it, and they still don't know how to resolve that conflict? What kind of advice would you give them? Well, I would say begin with the end in mind. I mean, that's a lovely old chestnut from Stephen Covey. 
What do they want out of it? One of my favorite formulas for life, certainly for leadership, but for life, I call it E plus R equals O. Event plus response equals outcome. And so look at the outcome. Where you are is the event. Look mm -hmm. at where you want to be. And then that will help inform your response. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think that sometimes we get stymied because we look at the problem in front of us and we just can't see beyond it. We can't, the mm -hmm. conflict or the whatever, we don't know what we want on the other side. Yeah. Um, I think that's also why sometimes leaders keep less than optimal employees around longer than they should. They don't have any faith that there's something better on the other side, or they don't even know really what they're looking for on the other side. And I think this happens with conflict too. I'm here, here's a roadblock, but I don't really know what I want on the other side. Because once you're really clear about what you want on the other side, the array of responses to get you there, the array of R's to get you to the O, mm -hmm. um, really open up. And you know what? You may not always choose the right one. And that's yeah. okay. That's just learning. You may, you know, reading my book isn't going to eliminate conflict from your life, but it's going to make you more confident that you can handle it. So if you're up against something and you're afraid it's going to um, create a conflict and you think you know what you want on the other side and you choose a response and you're wrong, well, now you're in the middle of a conflict, but you can relax because you know that by clear communication, just being authentic and transparent, apologize. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that that was going to make you upset. I'm sorry. Here's what I was thinking I was doing will always get you to the other side. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. I, I know I'm in some of the conflict resolutions that I've done with folks the person on uh, each side, it's like, think about what you're doing is, is that outcome that you're going to have something that you can live with? Right. Because sometimes it isn't. And right. they're so blinded to that. Yep. Yeah. So it yeah. makes matters worse. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I always say that we live life forward, but we understand it backwards. And the trick to dealing with conflict is to take a moment and think backwards a little bit, like project yourself into the future, say, what am I going to get if it goes this way? And mm -hmm. then reflect as if it's happened this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then try to think, well, I mean, I love to role play as a project lead. I did set the ground rules and all that, but there were times when I would go into a situation and I just role played it with my mentor just so I could yeah. be ready for the different situations and and yeah. how I responded was great for that mentor to come back and uh, and say okay well maybe the tone could be different or mm -hmm. the words that you chose mm -hmm. might not be the best ones think about that because if we just go on emotion mm -hmm. the words that come out might not always be really the best ones for the situation to keep Absolutely. it from escalating Absolutely. And I have role play as one of the strategies in my book. And the other thing I point out, it's not only words, it's tone of voice. You know, there have been oh, yeah. plenty of citations of this study done almost 50 years ago now that only 7% of what of communication is the content of the words. And 38% is your tone of voice and 55% is your body language. Yeah. So, you know, there's a huge difference between saying, I don't think this is working out, you know, I don't think we should do this again. And I don't think we should do this again. You know? yeah. Well, and, and that goes back to the written word. If an email, uh, yeah. you know, I always used to send my emails to me before I sent those kind of emails out because yep. the way that it's perceived, but even in that, so, the, I've had situations where someone read it differently or heard it differently than you intended intended and so that's when I think we have to be courageous enough to say you know I this is what I heard you say and this is yes. what I believe you meant is that accurate yes and, and a lot of times we're too afraid to say that but I, I think it solves a lot of angst if you do that 
I have a fun, quick story about this that I use in the book. I have a friend who was, when she was dating her now husband, they were having a long distance relationship between Colorado and California. And he had flown from Colorado to come see her for the weekend. They'd had this fabulous weekend. And toward the end of the weekend, she started to get a little bit of a cold. So she dropped him off at the airport and said, I'm just going to bed. Don't call me when you land. I'm just going to go to bed, take some meds. And he said, okay, fine. So she drops him off the airport, gets home. She's not feeling well. And she starts to thinking about this great weekend she had. And she realized, you know, I don't know what he's like when he's sick. Sometimes men can have the reputation of being kind of a baby. And so before she went to sleep, she just texted him a question. What kind of a sick person are you? So she's thinking it's this innocent question about what's he like when he's got a cold. You see where this is going, of course. Yeah, I do. <laughs> he, land, he lands his airplane later, and of course he wasn't going to call her, but he get, opens up his phone to this text, and he reads it like, what kind of a sick person are you, you know? And uh, so he immediately called her and woke her up, and they obviously worked it out. They've been happily married for years, but that is exactly yeah. the problem with that written communication. Yeah, for sure. And it just takes you off guard. It's like, what? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> exactly. All right. It's time for a rapid fire. We're, we're just going to give uh, one. Talk to me about building a culture of optimism. Well, building any culture starts with the leader. So building a culture of optimism starts with the leader. And it has to come from a belief that there's always a solution and that everybody can be part of that solution. Right, right. And and I think um, it doesn't have to be a win-win. A it, it, there's oftentimes it's a compromise, but how do you accept that compromise is probably um, how you keep optimistic about it. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I think that comes back to shared vision too. Mm -hmm. If everyone has the same vision, if you're sure that yeah. everyone is going after the same thing, it takes the conversation out of different points of view at, you know, where my point of view versus your point of view, um, where you butt heads to both our point of views are valid to get us to the higher vision. And so let's figure out how we accommodate them. Yeah, that's excellent. All right. It's time now for me to share my screen. So if you are just listening in, Remember that you should have grabbed a pencil paper, but if you have not, go ahead and get that now so you can get the website information for Dr. Judy. And um, all this information will be on my YouTube channel as well as the show notes on my website. All right. So those of you that are just listening, go to https colon forward slash forward slash D-R-J-U-D-Y-M-O-R-L-E-Y dot net. So that's drjudymorley.net. Again, drjudymorley.net. For Facebook, jo uh, Judy M. Morley. That's ju judy.m.morley. LinkedIn is Judy Morley. Instagram is Dr. Judy Morley. YouTube, just search Dr. Judy Morley and you will find her. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Judy now to talk to you about what you can find on her website and also a little bit more about her book. Yeah, well, um, yeah, if you go to my website, you can uh, get on my mailing list and sign up for my blog where I give tips on how awesome. to master conflict. Um, you can also find, um, I've got classes and of course, links to all of my books, including Master Conflict Without Being a Bitch. It's my third book. So, um, and it's also available on Amazon. Awesome. All right. So definitely y'all need to grab that book on Amazon, um, but take advantage of those blogs. Sometimes we just need a daily reminder or a weekly reminder. So take advantage of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Judy, for being such a wonderful guest. You know, conflict is something that we avoid oftentimes, but um, sometimes if we just address it, it be, can be diffused and, and not really escalate. So um, I hope everyone will take advantage of going to your website, again, drjudymorley.net, to get that um, those blogs, get her book, again, and uh, learn how to manage conflict navigate conflict, master conflict without being a bitch. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for being an awesome guest. Thank you. All right. As always, I remind everyone that life is a journey and it is up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nethling signing off. 
you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling, where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.